Section four of Chesterfield's Letters to His Son. Read for LibriVox.org into the public domain. Letter eight. London, April third, Old Style, 1747. Dear boy, if I am rightly informed, I am now writing to a fine gentleman, in a scarlet coat laced with gold, a brocade waistcoat, and all other suitable ornaments. The natural partiality of every author for his own works makes me very glad to hear that Mr. Hart has thought this last edition of mine worth so fine a binding, and as he has bound it in red, and gilt it upon the back, I hope he will take care that it shall be lettered, too. A showish binding attracts the eyes, and engages the attention of everybody, but with this difference, that women and men who are like women mind the binding more than the book, whereas men of sense and learning immediately examine the inside, and if they find that it does not answer the finery on the outside, they throw it by with the greater indignation and contempt. I hope that, when this edition of my work shall be opened and read, the best judges will find connection, consistency, solidity, and spirit in it. Mr. Hart may be recensaire and emendaire, as much as he pleases, but it will be to little purpose if you do not cooperate with him. The work will be imperfect." I thank you for your last information of our success in the Mediterranean, and you say very rightly that a Secretary of State ought to be well informed. I hope, therefore, that you will take care that I shall. You are near the busy scene in Italy, and I doubt not but that, by frequently looking at the map, you have all that theatre of the war very perfect in your mind. I like your account of the salt works, which shows that you gave some attention while you were seeing them. But notwithstanding that, by your account, the Swiss salt is, I dare say, very good, yet I am apt to suspect that it falls a little short of the true Attic salt, in which there was a peculiar quickness and delicacy. That same Attic salt seasoned almost all Greece, except Boeotia, and a great deal of it was exported afterward to Rome, where it was counterfeited by a composition called urbanity, which in some time was brought to very near the perfection of the original Attic salt. The more you are powdered with these two kinds of salt, the better you will keep, and the more you will be relished. Adieu. My compliments to Mr. Hart and Mr. Elliot. Letter 9. London. April 14th, Old Style, 1747. Dear boy, If you feel half the pleasure from the consciousness of doing well, that I do from the informations I have lately received in your favour from Mr. Hart, I shall have little occasion to exhort or admonish you any more to do what your own satisfaction and self-love will sufficiently prompt you to. Mr. Hart tells me that you attend, and that you apply to your studies, and that, beginning to understand, you begin to taste them. This pleasure will increase, and keep pace with your attention, so that the balance will be greatly to your advantage. You may remember that I have always earnestly recommended to you to do what you are about, be that what it will and to do nothing else at the same time. Do not imagine that I mean by this, that you should attend to and plod at your book all day long, far from it. I mean that you should have your pleasures too, and that you should attend to them for the time as much as to your studies, and if you do not attend equally to both, you will neither have improvement nor satisfaction from either. A man is fit for neither business nor pleasure, who either cannot or does not command and direct his attention to the present object and in some degree banish for that time all other objects from his thoughts. If at a ball, a supper, or a party of pleasure, a man were to be solving in his own mind a problem in Euclid, he would be a very bad companion, and make a very poor figure in that company. Or if, in studying a problem in his closet, he were to think of a minuet, I am apt to believe that he would make a very poor mathematician. There is time enough for everything, in the course of the day if you do but one thing at once. But there is not time enough in the year, if you will do two things at a time. The pensionary De Witt, who was torn to pieces in the year 1672, did the whole business of the Republic, and yet had time to go to assemblies in the evening and sup in company. Being asked how he could possibly find time to go through so much business, and yet amuse himself in the evenings as he did, he answered, there was nothing so easy for that it was only doing one thing at a time, and never putting off anything till to-morrow that could be done to-day. This steady and undissipated attention to one object is a sure mark of a superior genius, as hurry, bustle, and agitation are the never-failing symptoms of a weak and frivolous mind. When you read Horace, 
attend to the justness of his thoughts, the happiness of his diction, and the beauty of his poetry, and do not think of Puffendorf de Homine El Cive, and when you are reading Puffendorf, do not think of Madame de Saint Germain, nor of Puffendorf, when you are talking to Madame de Saint Germain. Mr. Hart informs me that he has reimbursed you part of your losses in Germany, and I consent to his reimbursing you of the whole, now that I know you deserve it. I shall grudge you nothing, nor shall you want anything that you desire, provided you deserve it, so that, you see, it is in your own power to have whatever you please. There is a little book which you read here with M. Coderre, entitled Manière de bien penser dans l'ouvrage d'esprit, written by Pierre Bonheur. I wish you would read this book again at your leisure hours, for it will not only divert you, but likewise form your taste, and give you a just manner of thinking. Adieu. Letter 10. London, June thirtieth, Old Style, 1747. Dear boy, I was extremely pleased with the account which you gave me in your last, of the civilities that you received in your Swiss progress, and I have written by this post to Mr. Burnaby, and to the Avoyer, to thank them for their parts. If the attention you met with pleased you, as I dare say it did, you will, I hope, draw this general conclusion from it, that attention and civility please all those to whom they are paid, and that you will please others in proportion as you are attentive and civil to them. Bishop Burnett has wrote his travels through Switzerland, and Mr. Stanion, from a long residence there, has written the best account, yet extant, of the thirteen cantons. But those books will be read no more, I presume, after you shall have published your account of that country. I hope you will favor me with one of the first copies. To be serious, though I do not desire that you should immediately turn author, and oblige the world with your travels, yet wherever you go, I would have you as curious and inquisitive as if you did intend to write them. I do not mean that you should give yourself so much trouble, to know the number of houses, inhabitants, signposts, and tombstones, of every town that you go through, but that you should inform yourself, as well as your stay will permit you, whether the town is free, or to whom it belongs, or in what manner, whether it has any peculiar privileges or customs, what trade or manufactures, and other such particulars as people of sense desire to know. And there would be no manner of harm if you were to take memorandums of such things in a paper book to help your memory. The only way of knowing all these things is to keep the best company, who can best inform you of them. I am just now called away, so good night. End of section 4. Read by Professor Heather and By. For more free audiobooks or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Letter 11. London, July 20th, Old Style, 1747. Dear Boy, In your mamma's letter, which goes here enclosed, you will find one from my sister, to thank you for the arquebusade water which you sent her, and which she takes very kindly. She would not show me her letter to you, but told me that it contained good wishes and good advice, and, as I know she will show your letter in answer to hers, I send you here enclosed the draft of the letter which I would have you write to her. I hope you will not be offended at my offering you my assistance upon this occasion, because, I presume, that as yet you are not much used to write to ladies. Apropos of letter-writing, the best models that you can form yourself upon are Cicero, Cardinal d'Assat, Madame Savigny, and Comte bussy Rebutin. Cicero's epistles to Atticus, and to his familiar friends, are the best examples that you can imitate, in the friendly and in the familiar style. The simplicity and the clearness of Cardinal d'Assat's letters show how letters of business ought to be written. No affected turns, no attempts at wit, obscure or perplex his matter, which is always plainly and clearly stated, as business always should be. For gay and amusing letters, for enjoyment and badinage, there are none that equal Comte Bussy's and Madame Savigny's. They are so natural that they seem to be the extempore conversations of two people of wit, rather than letters which are commonly studied, though they ought not to be so. I would advise you to let that book be one in your itinerant library. It will both amuse and inform you. I have not time to add any more now, so good night. Letter 12. London. July 30th, Old Style, 1747. Dear boy, It is now four posts since I have received any letter, 
either from you or from Mr. Hart. I impute this to the rapidity of your travels through Switzerland, which I suppose are by this time finished. You will have found by my late letters, both to you and Mr. Hart, that you are to be at Leipzig by next Michaelmas, where you will be lodged in the house of Professor Moscow, and boarded in the neighborhood of it, with some young men of fashion. The professor will read you letters upon Grotius de Jure Belli et Passis, the Institutes of Justinian, and the Jus Publicum Imperii, which I expect that you shall not only hear, but attend to, and retain. I also expect that you make yourself perfectly master of the German language, which you may very soon do there, if you please. I give you fair warning, that at Leipzig I shall have an hundred invisible spies about you, and shall be exactly informed of everything that you do, and of almost everything that you say. I hope that, in consequence of those minute informations, I may be able to say of you, what Velius Paterculus says of Scipio, that in his whole life, nihil non laudanum ac dixit, ac fecit, ac sensit. There is a great deal of good company in Leipzig, which I would have you frequent in the evenings, when the studies of the day are over. There is likewise a kind of court kept there, by a duchess dowager of Courland, at which you should get introduced. The king of Poland and his court go likewise to the fair at Leipzig twice a year, and I shall write to Sir Charles Williams, the king's minister there, to have you presented, and introduced into good company. But I must remind you at the same time, that it will be to a very little purpose for you to frequent good company, if you do not conform to and learn their manners, if you are not attentive to please, and well-bred, with the easiness of a man of fashion. As you must attend to your manners, so you must not neglect your person, but take care to be very clean, well-dressed, and genteel, to have no disagreeable attitudes, nor awkward tricks, which many people use themselves to, and then cannot leave them off. Do you take care to keep your teeth very clean, by washing them constantly every morning and after every meal? This is very necessary, both to preserve your teeth a great while, and to save you a great deal of pain. Mine have plagued me long, and are now falling out, merely from want of care when I was your age. Do you dress well, and not too well? Do you consider your air and manner of presenting yourself enough, and not too much? Neither negligent nor stiff? All these things deserve a great deal of care, a second-rate attention. They give an additional luster to real merit. My Lord Bacon says that a pleasing figure is a perpetual letter of recommendation. It is certainly an agreeable forerunner of merit, and smooths the way for it. Remember that I shall see you at Hanover next summer, and shall expect perfection, which if I do not meet with, or at least something very near it, you and I shall not be very well together. I shall dissect and analyze you with a microscope, so that I shall discover the least speck or blemish. This is fair warning, therefore take your measures accordingly. Yours. Letter 13. London, August 21st, Old Style, 1747. Dear boy, I reckon that this letter has but a bare chance of finding you at Lausanne, but I was resolved to risk it, as it is the last I shall write to you till you are settled at Leipzig. I sent you by the last post, under cover to Mr. Hart, a letter of recommendation to one of the first people at Munich, which you will take care to present to him in the politest manner. He will certainly have you presented to the electoral family, and I hope you will go through that ceremony with great respect, good breeding, and ease. As this is the first court that ever you will have been at, take care to inform yourself if there be any particular customs or forms to be observed, that you may not commit any mistake. At Vienna, men always make curtsies instead of bows, to the emperor. In France, nobody bows at all to the king, nor kisses his hand. But in Spain and England, bows are made, and hands are kissed. Thus every court has some peculiarity or other, of which those who go to them ought previously to inform themselves, to avoid blunders and awkwardnesses. I have not time to say any more now, than to wish you good journey to Leipzig, and great attention, both there and in going there. Adieu. Letter 14. London, September 21st, Old Style, 1747. Dear Boy, I received by the last post your letter of the 8th, New Style, and I do not wonder that you are surprised at the credulity and superstition of the Papist at Einsiedlen, and at their absurd stories of their chapel. But remember at the same time that errors and mistakes, however gross, in matters of opinion, if they are sincere, are to be pitied, but not punished nor laughed at. 
the blindness of the understanding is as much to be pitied as the blindness of the eye, and there is neither jest nor guilt in a man's losing his way in either case. Charity bids us set him right if we can, by arguments and persuasions, but charity at the same time forbids either to punish or ridicule his misfortune. Every man's reason is, and must be, his guide, and I may as well expect that every man should be of my size and complexion, as that he should reason just as I do. Every man seeks for truth, but God only knows who has found it. It is, therefore, as unjust to persecute as it is absurd to ridicule, people for those several opinions, which they cannot help entertaining upon the conviction of their reason. It is the man who tells or acts a lie that is guilty, and not he who honestly and sincerely believes the lie. I really know nothing more criminal, more mean, and more ridiculous than lying. It is the production either of malice, cowardice, or vanity, and generally misses of its aim in every one of these views, for lies are always detected sooner or later. If I tell a malicious lie, in order to affect any man's fortune or character, I may indeed injure him for some time, but I shall be sure to be the greatest sufferer myself at last, for as soon as I am ever detected, and detected I most certainly shall be, I am blasted for the infamous attempt, and whatever is said afterward, to the disadvantage of that person, however true, passes for calumny. If I lie, or equivocate, for it is the same thing, in order to excuse myself for something that I have said or done, and to avoid the danger and the shame that I apprehend from it, I discover at once my fear as well as my falsehood, and only increase, instead of avoiding, the danger and the shame. I show myself to be the lowest and the meanest of mankind, and am sure to be always treated as such. Fear, instead of avoiding, invites danger, for concealing cowards will insult known ones. If one has the misfortune to be in the wrong, there is something noble in frankly owning it. It is the only way of atoning for it, and the only way of being forgiven. Equivocating, evading, shuffling, in order to remove a present danger or inconveniency, is something so mean, and betrays so much fear, that whoever practices them always deserves to be, and often will be, kicked. There is another sort of lies, inoffensive enough in themselves, but wonderfully ridiculous. I mean those lies which a mistaken vanity suggests, that defeat the very end for which they are calculated, and terminate in the humiliation and confusion of their author, who is sure to be detected. These are chiefly narrative and historical lies, all intended to do infinite honor to their author. He is always the hero of his own romances. He has been in dangers from which nobody but himself ever escaped. He has seen with his own eyes whatever other people have heard or read of. He has had more bonne fortune than ever he knew women, and has ridden more miles post in one day than ever courier went in two. He is soon discovered, and as soon becomes the object of universal contempt and ridicule. Remember then, as long as you live, that nothing but strict truth can carry you through the world, with either your conscience or your honor unwounded. It is not only your duty but your interest, as a proof of which you may always observe that the greatest fools are the greatest liars. For my own part, I judge of every man's truth by his degree of understanding. This letter will, I suppose, find you at Leipzig, where I expect and require from you attention and accuracy, in both which you have hitherto been very deficient. Remember that I shall see you in the summer, shall examine you most narrowly, and will never forget nor forgive those faults, which it has been in your own power to prevent or cure, and be assured that I have many eyes upon you at Leipzig, besides Mr. Hart's. Adieu. Letter 15. London, October 2nd, Old Style, 1747. Dear Boy, By your letter of the 18th past, new style, I find that you are a tolerably good landscape painter, and can present the several views of Switzerland to the curious. I am very glad of it, as it is a proof of some attention, but I hope you will be as good a portrait painter, which is a much more noble science. By portraits you will easily judge that I do not mean the outlines and the coloring of the human figure, but the inside of the heart and mind of man. This science requires more attention, observation, and penetration than the other, as, indeed, it is infinitely more useful. Search, therefore, with the greatest care, into the characters of those whom you converse with. Endeavor to discover their predominant passions, their prevailing weaknesses, 
their vanities, their follies, and their humours, with all the right and wrong, wise and silly springs of human actions, which make such inconsistent and whimsical beings of us rational creatures. A moderate share of penetration, with great attention, will infallibly make these necessary discoveries. This is the true knowledge of the world, and the world is a country which nobody ever yet knew by description. One must travel through it one's self to be acquainted with it. The scholar, who in the dust of his closet talks or writes of the world, knows no more of it than that orator of war did, who judiciously endeavoured to instruct Hannibal in it. Courts and camps are the only places to learn the world in. There alone all kinds of characters resort, and human nature is seen in all the various shapes and modes, which education, custom, and habit give it, whereas in all other places one local mode generally prevails, and producing a seeming, though not a real, sameness of character. For example, one general mode distinguishes an university, another a trading town, a third a seaport town, and so on, whereas at a capital, where the prince or the supreme power resides, some of all these various modes are to be seen, and seen in action too, exerting their utmost skill in pursuit of their several objects. Human nature is the same all over the world, but its operations are so varied by education and habit, that one must see it in all its dresses in order to be intimately acquainted with it. The passion of ambition, for instance, is the same in a courtier, a soldier, or an ecclesiastic, but from their different educations and habits, they will take very different methods to gratify it. Civility, which is a disposition to accommodate and oblige others, is essentially the same in every country, but good breeding, as it is called, which is the manner of exerting that disposition, is different in almost every country, and merely local. And every man of sense imitates and conforms to that local good breeding of the place which he is at. A conformity and flexibility of manners is necessary in the course of the world, that is, with regard to all things which are not wrong in themselves. The versatile ingenium is the most useful of all. It can turn itself instantly from one object to another, assuming the proper manner for each. It can be serious with the grave, cheerful with the gay, and trifling with the frivolous. Endeavor by all means to acquire this talent, for it is a very great one. As I hardly know anything more useful than to see from time to time pictures of one's self drawn by different hands, I send you here a sketch of yourself drawn at Luçon while you were there, and sent over here by a person who little thought that it would ever fall into my hands, and indeed it was by the greatest accident in the world that it did. End of section 6. Read by Professor Heather and by. For more free audiobooks, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Letter 16. London, October ninth, Old Style, 1747. Dear Boy, People of your age have, commonly, an unguarded frankness about them, which makes them the easy prey and bubbles of the artful and the experienced. They look upon every knave or fool, who tells them that he is their friend, to be really so, and pay that profession of simulated friendship, with an indiscreet and unbounded confidence, always to their loss, often to their ruin. Beware, therefore, now that you are coming into the world, of these preferred friendships. Receive them with great civility, but with great incredulity, too, and pay them with compliments, but not with confidence. Do not let your vanity and self-love make you suppose that people become your friends at first sight, or even upon a short acquaintance. Real friendship is a slow grower, and never thrives unless engrafted upon a stock of known and reciprocal merit. There is another kind of nominal friendship among young people, which is warm for the time, but by good luck of short duration. This friendship is hastily produced by their being accidentally thrown together, and pursuing the course of riot and debauchery. A fine friendship, truly, and well cemented by drunkenness and lewdness. It should rather be called a conspiracy against morals and good manners, and be punished as such by the civil magistrate. However, they have the impudence and folly to call this confederacy a friendship. They lend one another money for bad purposes, they engage in quarrels, offensive and defensive, for their accomplices, they tell one another all they know, and often more too, when of a sudden some accident disperses them, and they think no more of each other, unless it be to betray and laugh at their imprudent confidence. Remember to make a great difference between companions and friends, 
for a very complacent and agreeable companion may, and often does, prove a very improper and a very dangerous friend. People will, in a great degree, and not without reason, form their opinion of you, upon that which they have of your friends. And there is a Spanish proverb, which says very justly, Tell me who you live with, and I will tell you who you are. One may fairly suppose, then, that the man who makes a knave or fool his friend has something very bad to do or to conceal. But at the same time that you carefully decline the friendship of knaves and fools, if it can be called friendship, there is no occasion to make either of them your enemies, wantonly and unprovoked, for they are numerous bodies, and I would rather choose a secure neutrality than alliance or war with either of them. You may be a declared enemy to their vices and follies, without being marked out by them as a personal one. Their enmity is the next dangerous thing to their friendship. Have a real reserve with almost everybody, and have a seeming reserve with almost nobody, for it is very disagreeable to seem reserved, and very dangerous not to be so. Few people find the true medium. Many are ridiculously mysterious and reserved upon trifles, and many imprudently communicative of all they know. The next thing to the choice of your friends is the choice of your company. Endeavor as much as you can to keep company with people above you. There you rise, as much as you sink with people below you. For, as I have mentioned before, you are whatever the company you keep is. Do not mistake. When I say company above you, and think that I mean with regard to their birth, that is the least consideration. But I mean with regard to their merit, and the light in which the world considers them. There are two sorts of good company, one which is called the beau monde, and consists of the people who have the lead in courts, and in the gay parts of life. The other consists of those who are distinguished by some peculiar merit, or who excel in some particular and valuable art or science. For my own part, I used to think myself in company as much above me, when I was with Mr. Addison and Mr. Pope, as if I had been with all the princes in Europe. What I mean by low company, which should by all means be avoided, is the company of those who, absolutely insignificant and contemptible in themselves, think they are honoured by being in your company, and who flatter every vice and every folly you have, in order to engage you to converse with them. The pride of being the first of the company is but too common, but it is very silly and very prejudicial. Nothing in the world lets down a character quicker than that wrong turn. You may probably ask me, whether a man has it always in his power to get the best company, and how? I say, yes he has, by deserving it, providing he is but in circumstances which enable him to appear upon the footing of a gentleman. Merit and good breeding will make their way everywhere. Knowledge will introduce him, and good breeding will endear him to the best companies. For as I have often told you, politeness and good breeding are absolutely necessary to adorn any, or all other good qualities and talents. Without them, no knowledge, no perfection whatever, is seen in its best light. The scholar, without good breeding, is a pedant, the philosopher a cynic, the soldier a brute, and every man disagreeable. I long to hear, from my several correspondents at Leipzig, of your arrival there, and what impression you make on them at first, for I have arguses with a hundred eyes each, who will watch you narrowly, and relate to me faithfully. My accounts will certainly be true. It depends upon you entirely of what kind they shall be. Adieu. End of section 7. Read by Professor Heather and By. For more free audiobooks or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Letter 17. London. October 16th, Old Style, 1747. Dear Boy, the art of pleasing is a very necessary one to possess, but a very difficult one to acquire. It can hardly be reduced to rules, and your own good sense and observation will teach you more of it than I can. Do as you would be done by is the surest method that I know of pleasing. Observe carefully what pleases you in others, and probably the same thing in you will please others. If you are pleased with the complacence and attention of others to your humors, your tastes, or your weaknesses, Depend upon it the same complacence and attention, on your part to theirs, will equally please them. Take the tone of the company that you are in, and do not pretend to give it. Be serious, gay, or even trifling as you find the present humor of the company. 
This is an attention due from every individual to the majority. Do not tell stories in company. There is nothing more tedious and disagreeable. If by chance you know a very short story, and exceedingly applicable to the present subject of conversation, tell it in as few words as possible, and even then, throw out that you do not love to tell stories, but that the shortness of it tempted you. Of all things, banish egotism out of your conversation, and never think of entertaining people with your own personal concerns, or private affairs. Though they are interesting to you, they are tedious and impertinent to everybody else. Besides that, one cannot keep one's own private affairs too secret. Whatever you think your own excellencies may be, do not affectedly display them in company, nor labor, as many people do, to give that turn to the conversation, which may supply you with an opportunity of exhibiting them. If they are real, they will infallibly be discovered, without your pointing them out yourself, and with much more advantage. Never maintain an argument with heat and clamor, though you think or know yourself to be in the right, but give your opinion modestly and coolly, which is the only way to convince. And if that does not do, try to change the conversation by saying, with good humor, we shall hardly convince one another, nor is it necessary that we should, so let us talk of something else. Remember that there is a local propriety to be observed in all companies, and that what is extremely proper in one company may be, and often is, highly improper in another. The jokes, the bon mots, the little adventures, which may do very well in one company, will seem flat and tedious when related in another. The particular characters, the habits, the cant of one company, may give merit to a word or a gesture, which would have none at all if divested of those accidental circumstances. Here people very commonly err, and fond of something that has entertained them in one company, and in certain circumstances, repeat it with emphasis in another, where it is either insipid, or it may be offensive, by being ill-timed or misplaced. Nay, they will often do it with this silly preamble, I will tell you an excellent thing, or... I will tell you the best thing in the world. This raises expectations, which, when absolutely disappointed, make the relator of this excellent thing look, very deservedly, like a fool. If you would particularly gain the affection and friendship of particular people, whether men or women, endeavor to find out the predominant excellency, if they have one, and their prevailing weaknesses, which everybody has, and do justice to the one, and something more than justice to the other. Men have various objects in which they may excel, or at least would be thought to excel, and though they love to hear justice done to them, where they know that they excel, yet they are most and best flattered upon those points where they wish to excel, and yet are doubtful whether they do or not. As, for example, Cardinal Richelieu, who was undoubtedly the ablest statesman of his time, or perhaps of any other, had the idle vanity of being thought to be the best poet too. He envied the great Cornille his reputation, and ordered a criticism to be written upon the Cid. Those, therefore, who flattered skilfully, said little to him of his abilities in state affairs, or at least but en passant, and as it might naturally occur. But the incense which they gave him, the smoke of which they knew would turn his head in their favor, was as a bel esprit and a poet. Why? Because he was sure of one excellency, and distrustful as to the other. You will easily discover every man's prevailing vanity, by observing his favorite topic of conversation, for every man talks most of what he has most a mind to be thought to excel in. Touch him but there, and you touch him to the quick. The late Sir Robert Walpole, who was certainly an able man, was little open to flattery upon that head, for he was in no doubt himself about it, but his prevailing weakness was to be thought to have a polite and happy turn to gallantry, of which he had undoubtedly less than any man living. It was his favorite and frequent subject of conversation, which proved, to those who had any penetration, that it was his prevailing weakness, and they applied to it with success. Women have in general but one object, which is their beauty, upon which scarce any flattery is too gross for them to swallow. Nature has hardly formed a woman ugly enough to be insensible to flattery upon her person. If her face is so shocking that she must in some degree be conscious of it, her figure and her air, she trusts, make ample amends for it. If her figure is deformed, her face, she thinks, counterbalances it. If they are both bad, she comforts herself that she has graces, a certain matter, a je ne sais quoi, still more engaging than beauty. 
This truth is evident from the studied and elaborate dress of the ugliest women in the world. An undoubted, uncontested, conscious beauty is of all women the least sensible to flattery upon that head. She knows that it is her due, and is therefore obliged to nobody for giving it her. She must be flattered upon her understanding, which, though she may possibly not doubt of herself, yet she suspects that men may distrust. Do not mistake me, and think that I mean to recommend to you abject and criminal flattery. No, flatter nobody's vices or crimes. On the contrary, abhor and discourage them. But there is no living in the world without a complacent indulgence for people's weaknesses, and innocent though ridiculous vanities. If a man has a mind to be thought wiser, and a woman handsomer than they really are, their error is a comfortable one to themselves, and an innocent one with regard to other people, and I would rather make them my friends by indulging them in it, than my enemies, by endeavouring, and that to no purpose, to undeceive them. There are little attentions likewise, which are infinitely engaging, and which sensibly affect that degree of pride and self-love, which is inseparable from human nature, as they are unquestionable proofs of the regard and consideration which we have for the person to whom we pay them. As, for example, to observe the little habits, the likings, the antipathies, and the tastes of those whom we would gain, and then take care to provide them with the one, and to secure from them the other, giving them genteely to understand that you had observed that they liked such a dish, or such a room, for which reason you had prepared it, or on the contrary, having observed that they had an aversion to such a dish, a dislike to such a person, etc., you had taken care to avoid presenting them. Such attention to trifles flatters self-love much more than greater things, as it makes people think themselves almost the only objects of your thoughts and care. These are some of the arcana necessary for your initiation in the great society of the world. I wish I had known them better at your age. I have paid the price of three and fifty years for them, and shall not grudge it if you reap the advantage. Adieu. End of section 8. Read by Professor Heather and By. For more free audiobooks or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org.